Hello and welcome to Daily Prayer today. Um, glad that you are with me as we reflect. We're continuing on in the uh, letter, the first one that we have to the Corinthians. Each day we will focus on scripture for a little bit. We'll unite in prayer. Um, this is, could be a time for your own sort of personal devotion and might be a way to learn or to just spend some time in prayer and reflection. So thanks for joining me. Let's go ahead and get started. This video comes out on May 25th, which is National Wine Day, African Liberation Day, Amateur Radio Military Appreciation Day, Argentina Revolution Day, and Geek Pride Day. But of course, you could watch this any day you want to. Let's go ahead and get started first with a centering breath prayer. Breathe in. Breathe out. Breathe in. Breathe out. Breathe in. Breathe out. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses. Our reading for today is 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 through 8. Listen for God's word to speak to you. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and the sort of sexual immorality that is not found even among Gentiles. For a man is living with his father's wife, and you are arrogant. Should you not rather have mourned so that he who has done this would have been removed from among you? For I, though absent in body, am present in spirit, and as if present, I have already pronounced judgment. In the name of the Lord Jesus, on the man who has done such a thing. When you are assembled, and my spirit is present with the power of our Lord Jesus, you are to hand this man over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, so that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Your boasting is not a good thing. Do you not know that a little yeast leavens all of the dough? Clean out the old yeast, so that you may be a new batch of dough, as you really are unleavened. For our Paschal Lamb, Christ, has been sacrificed. Therefore let us celebrate the festival, not with the old yeast, the yeast of malice and evil, but with an unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Oh boy. So uh, now we get into the second sort of major uh, controversy, I suppose, for this letter to the Corinthians. We've talked about sort of introduction to the church in Corinth. Paul spent uh, about a year and a half there, started up the church. There have been other leaders there's been some sort of dissension um, and division within the congregation or congregations, it's possible, um, multiple sort of house churches, because congregation just means group of people, right? Um, there's been some divisions among them about who follows Paul, who follows Apollos, who follows Peter, stuff like that. So he's sort of set them straight about those things, saying that, you know, we're all servants of Christ, and so we all serve Christ together. We may be different, but we're not, we shouldn't be divided. He has claimed that his connection to them is not just a, a sort of teacher, guardian, nanny, right? Someone who instructs them, but as their very father, sort of one who has this deep connection to them. And in that deep connection, he has some really hard things to say. He said a couple of them, right? He basically called them babies for not being able to handle real meat. Um, but now he is going on to this issue that is going on here in the church in Corinth. It seems that there was a certain man 
who is in engaging in sexual immorality in the um, in Greek that word is porneia, which is uh, really challenging to actually translate. Um, it seems some sort of sexual immorality. That's pretty good. But to, to truly understand what Paul meant by that or what it meant in the first century versus what it means today is just a very challenging thing for interpreters. Uh, but that doesn't mean that there's not lots and lots of interpretations of what it could mean. And in fact, not only interpretations, but clear, definitive, this is absolutely what it means. What it seems to mean in this particular case is Paul has a problem with this particular man who is living with, and uh, we might assume having sexual relations with his father's wife. So there are a lot of layers there. Um, something to be mindful of. We are looking at this and just, just to know the lens that we look at this through. Oftentimes in the American 21st century church is through the lens of um, sort of purity culture and sort of a, an ideal of very specific, very stringent expectations on what appropriate sexual relations look like. And therefore, anything that is outside of that would be this pornea. This would be this, um, you know, sexual immorality. Those are not expectations that would have been the same for the first century. We can have, have lots of conversations around what they might mean and, and how we interpret that way. But I think that's pretty easy to make a claim of that those would just not be the same expectations. Partially because the way that we see all of this is a much different way. Um, for instance, the idea of heterosexuality, um, the usually used as almost a sort of default, default or maybe majority way of uh, experiencing sexual sort of uh, attraction, but also uh, draw towards relationship and intimate sexual relationships with someone of the opposite gender as kind of being the default. This is how everything works. That's a 20th century, 19th century uh, idea that is not something that has, was ever really thought about in that same way. Um, of course, people have engaged in sexual relationships uh, throughout history, but that sort of idea of this is the very clear, this is the way that it's supposed to happen, um, just wasn't didn't exist in that same way. So that's part of something to be mindful of, that that's not what Paul may be looking at or looking for. We also recognize um, some of us have recently gone through the book of Leviticus, and there are some pretty clear things there about uh, just righteousness in general, right? Relationship, being in right relationship with one another, and specifically engaging in sexual relationship with someone who is your father's wife is transgressive, but not in a way that we would um, attribute sort of the sexual side of that being the most important. Ultimately, the most important thing to that transgressive active activity is that it is a transgression of righteousness, of right relationship. A lot of that, and we have to be truly honest, is tied up in um, patriarchal assumptions, both in the Hebrew culture and in the Roman culture, that women were considered property. And so, if you were to engage in sexual relationship with your father's wife, um, whether she is your mother or not, you are messing with your father's property. You are uh, transgressing in that way. 
specifically also this relationship with his father's wife also has overtones to uh, the sin of Ham, to other places that there's a intentional usurpation of your th father's authority. Um, trying to take over in a place where your father has dominance, specifically his bedroom, right? So there are a lot of sort of overtones here, especially in Hebrew culture, uh, but also in Roman culture as well, that this is a transgressive act, to, to be clear, right? Paul is not excited about this situation. Um, but our tendency in the 21st century American church is to assume that it's only sexual. And that's not the case. And in fact, that, that side of things may actually be the least important thing. Anyway, so there's this issue that this man is ha in a unrighteous relationship with his father's wife. So what is Paul, what's the prescription? What is Paul going to do about it? First, he says, you are arrogant. Um, he's suggesting that they should have mourned for this situation rather than it seems celebrating it. Um, so that he who has done this would have been removed from among you. And here we get into this idea of being removed from the community. Uh, someone who has transgressed, who has done something that they're not supposed to do. I believe the assumption here is a similar sort of path of um, sort of reconciliation that is presented in the Gospels by Jesus. If someone transgresses, right, whatever it might be, you go to them and say, hey, you have done this wrong thing. If they don't listen to you, then you go with a couple of the elders and you say, we're really concerned about this thing. You need to address it. If they still say, no, I'm not going to address it, you bring before them the, them before the full assembly and the full assembly hears everything and makes a decision whether they should be a part of the community or not. Along that path, there are multiple times to hear, well, what is the motivation? What's going on here in this situation? There are multiple uh, chances for one of those to hear to say, you know, actually, I think maybe this isn't that big of a deal and you're just blowing it out of, out of proportion. Or there's a chance for people to say, yeah, this is, this is terrible. This is not something we want to have in our community. And then there is this, um, in, in Jesus's words, we have the idea that they're to be treated as a Gentile, right? They're to be treated as one who is outside of the community, using sort of the assumption of Jewish folks who are inside and Gentile people who are outside. For Paul, that type of language is not going to be useful. And so he uses this idea of handing this man over to Satan, to the accuser, for destruction of the flesh, so that the spirit may be saved on the day of the Lord. Both in the words of Jesus, as well as here, there is an expectation of repentance, of reconciliation. That all of these steps are made so that this person might recognize their faults, realize what they have done, realize that it is acting out of unrighteousness, and then change their perspective. Live in a different way and come back that they might then become a part of the church. We know that in the early church, the season of Lent began as an opportunity, not only for those who are coming into the church, but also those who have been sort of excluded from the church and are now coming back to spend a significant period of time in fasting, in prayer, in meditation, and sort of in this process of reconciliation. And then on Easter, be reconciled to the community. In fact, this very person in the what we have as 2 Corinthians is invited. It, Paul encourages him to be invited back into the community because that repentance seemed to have been shown. So that's something to be very mindful of as well. Uh, sometimes we use this sort of idea of excommunication and in the Roman Catholic Church, especially in medieval Roman Catholicism, 
it was used as this deep punishment, right? You, salvation is only within the church and you are now outside of the church. You can't have salvation. Um, that's not what Paul is saying here. Paul is saying, I'm going to disconnect you from this community for a purpose, for a, a, a time so that you can learn from this. He also talks about this boasting that they have, that it's not a good thing. And allowing for this unrighteousness within the community is a problem. And it's like yeast that comes into dough that will sort of fill the rest of it. If you allow this type of unrighteousness within the congregation, then what else are you going to allow? This is a ongoing hot debate and conversation around what is allowable and what is not within the greater church. There are some who say that any type of sexual indiscretion should not be allowed, and specifically if it's queer, right? Um, because usually we don't talk a lot about all of the many ways that heterosexual people are transgressive in their sexual practice. Um, that you can't allow any of that. Don't say gay in this church, right? There's That is one option. There are also other options that say, hey, you know what, the way that we are uh, together, the fact that we allow for all sorts of white supremacy and nas uh, Christian nationalism within our theology, within the ways that we are being, the, the ways that we have used that same um, purity culture and have deeply broken people, the way that we allow for uh, patriarchy to continue to be a part of our communities and do deep violence, the, the way that we allow for abuse of all sorts of ways is also damaging to the church. Our call as the body of Christ and as communities of faith are to be beloved community, are to exhibit the kingdom of God or the kingdom of God for the world. And as Paul just said, right, our words aren't as important as our power, as what we actually do. And if we allow for inequity, if we allow for unrighteousness within our communities, they're going to rot from the inside. They're not going to be healthy. And so the reformers said that one of the three things that it means to be a church is um, where the word is proclaimed and heard, where the sacraments are rightly administered, and where ecclesiastical discipline is practiced. In the Presbyterian Church USA, one of the sections, major sections of our book of order that tells us how we are to do things is the book of discipline. That lays out a very clear sort of path inspired by scripture for if there is unrighteousness, how do you deal with that? And if it is serious, then there are serious consequences. How does that work? But also, how do we seek reconciliation? Restoring to relationships. So take some time to, to think through these things. I am sure you have heard this scripture before and maybe have heard it in different ways. How do we understand the sort of yeast of unrighteousness in our communities? What are those transgressions that we allow? And what are those transgressions that we do not allow? What are the ones that we really focus on and when are the, what are the ones we just kind of tacitly ignore and what does it mean for our communities what does it mean for people of faith take some time to think over these things to consider to pray to meditate to journal and when you're ready we'll join our hearts together in prayer to you O lord i lift my soul O oh God, in you I trust. 
Living God, thank you for the ways that we are called to be in relationship with you and with one another. The many ways that we seek to be in right relationship, righteous relationship, to do justice and love mercy and to walk humbly with you. For the ways that we seek that righteousness in hope of reconciliation and the ways that we have sought that right righteousness in ways that have been deeply harmful. Lord, bring us together. Despite our differences, despite the ways that we might divide ourselves, despite the ways that we may hurt each other. Help us to listen to one another, to understand, to sharpen each other. Thank you for the variety of communities of faith in which all can belong. We pray for all of those things in our church that are rotting us from the inside and drawing us away from your gospel. Unite us as your people, Lord Christ, as we pray together the words that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Christ has gathered the church in unity through the Spirit. With sure hope, let us pray. Lord, hear our prayer. Maker of all things, in the beginning you created the heavens and the earth. In the fullness of time you restored all things in Christ. Renew our world in this day with your grace and mercy. Lord, hear our prayer. Life of the world, you breathed life into the flesh you created. Now, by your Holy Spirit, breathe new life into your children of earth. Turn hatred into love, sorrow into joy, and war into peace. Lord, hear our prayer. Lover of concord, you desire the unity of all Christians. Set aflame the whole church with the fire of your spirit. Unite us to stand in the world as a sign of your love. Lord, hear our prayer. God of compassion, through your spirit you supply every human need. Heal the sick and comfort the distressed. Befriend the friendless and help the helpless. Lord, hear our prayer. Source of peace, your spirit restores our anxious spirits. In our labor, give us rest. In our temptation, strength. In our sadness, consolation. Lord, hear our prayer. God eternal, as you sent upon the disciples the promised gift of the Holy Spirit, look upon your church and open our hearts to the power of the Holy Spirit. Kindle in us the fire of your love and strengthen our lives for service in your kingdom. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The God of peace be with us. Amen. Bless the Lord. The Lord's name be praised. Thank you so much for joining me today for daily prayer. Join me tomorrow for some more, as well as joining us for worship at 1030.
you can uh, go to our, yep, okay. Our liturgy today came from the Book of Common Worship of the Presbyterian Church USA. Our reading came from the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible. You can subscribe on either John Calvin Presbyterian or on Rev Ochart. And wherever you do that, you can like and also click the little bell. That's the notification button. You can listen to uh, this daily prayer on Substack, on Spotify, uh, or wherever you listen to podcasts and sign up for a daily email on Substack. It's very rude that Substack and Spotify, um, at least in my brain, are, are pretty close. They all, both start with S. Anyways, thanks for joining me today. Uh, seek righteousness in your relationships and in the relationship of your community. Have a blessed day and we'll see you next time.